You may have heard the prayer that was floating around the internet uh, a few years ago. <clears throat> it goes something like this. It said, Dear Lord, I'm doing fine so far. I haven't said any bad words. I haven't lost my temper with my wife. I haven't yelled at anybody at work. I haven't looked at a woman in any bad way. But Lord, I'm getting ready to get out of bed. And I'm going to need your help the rest of the day. If you live in uh, human flesh, you're going to understand today's topic. You're going to know exactly what we're talking about. Because living in the flesh, living in this flesh means we deal with a lot of stuff. Some of it we don't want to deal with. Some of it is garbage, but yet we find ourselves in the middle of it, torn, as it were, between something good and something bad. And uh, so we've been in this study in Romans, Romans chapter 8, and we, we've learned a few things. <clears throat> the first seven chapters is almost like a prelude or an introductory to chapter 8. It's like chapter 8 is the big chapter in the book of Romans, in my opinion. It's like everything's there. Whatever you need from a theological standpoint, it's there. Whatever you want to know, uh, it's there. I mean, really, that you need to know. Some say it's the gospel. It is the gospel. Romans chapter 8 is Paul preaching the gospel. He told the Romans, he said, I want to be there, but I can't be there. I long to come to you. He said that in chapter 1. He said it in, in the later chapters. So some people think this is really a written sermon. And he said in chapter 7 something that really for a long time has, <clears throat> has bothered us. Uh, he said, uh, when I say bothered, I mean we can't explain it completely. It's, is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? We have scholars who are on both sides of that camp and say, well, he's talking about himself. Some say, no, 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 Paul wasn't like that. He's talking about somebody else. And basically what he says is, uh, there are times, I'll paraphrase it, there are times when I do things I don't want to do. As a matter of fact, I hate the fact that I'm doing these things. And, and there are other times when I know clearly the right thing to do, but I don't do it. And I tend to believe that he's talking about himself because that's human existence, isn't it? We live in this kind of dichotomy, this, this great division, this two sides. There's good and there's bad. And we've learned a couple things, two or three things really from the first few chapters in this introductory. We learned that we're all broken. Every single one of us, we're all broken. Josh Duggar is broken. Uh, Bruce Jenner is broken. Some would say broken more than others. But I'm broken. And you're broken. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your education level is, or your uh, bank amount, you're broken. We are all broken. Now, this should change the way you look at people who hurt you. This, this should, it should make you realize, hey, they're broken. They just hurt my feelings, or they just intentionally did that to knock me down. Before you get all upset and angry and get this heart of bitterness in your life, remember, they're broken people. And they may be more broken. Maybe they're not being surrendered. They're not being fixed, if you will. We also learned that the, the only way to stand in front of God one day and to hear him say, you are, you're okay, you're justified. That's that word, justified. And remember, I told you a lot of old-time preachers used to say, Here's how you remember justified, and that Bible word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. It's almost like on Judgment Day, <clears throat> we'll all come up and we'll stand in front of the great uh, judge, God Almighty. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, every single one of us. I don't know if we'll come up individually or if we'll come up as families and maybe dad will stand there. I kind of I tend to believe that's going to be the case, that if it's a family unit, the dad will stand there and the wife will be back here because he's the leader of that home. And then they, everybody will have their turn. But it's almost like that if you're in Christ, that if you're a Christian, if you have faith in Christ, that 
about the time you step up to take your place in front of the judge, Jesus slides in in front of you. And it's like, whew. And he's hiding you. And you're kind of like looking over his shoulder, you know, wondering what kind of sentence you're going to get. And God looks down, and he's looking at you, but then all of a sudden he sees his son, and he says, oh, you're hidden in my son. You're good. You're good to go. Isn't that a great image? He slides in in front of you, and when you're judged, God sees him. And he was perfect. He was sinless. He was the righteous one. That's what we talked about last week. So you're all good. And as long as you're in Christ, you're good. You're justified. He's like, I'm not holding any of this against you. We learned that last week. However, <clears throat> once we place our faith in Christ and hide ourselves in him, we, it doesn't, uh, the bad stuff doesn't go away, does it? I know a lot of people will come up out of the baptistry and they'll think, okay, my life, it's going to be, I'm no more temptation. I'm not going to deal with that struggle anymore. I'm not going to have this problem, this addiction, or this, this bad behavior. No, it doesn't work that way. In fact, let me tell you something, and I hope this isn't news for you, but it, it could be, but you probably already knew it, is that when you become a Christian, it might get tougher. He might come at you harder. The temptation might get stronger. Because guess what? The devil doesn't want to lose anybody on his team. He doesn't want to lose anybody. So the temptations might go up, and you, you might have a hard time. But remember, last week we saw this verse that if you're in Christ, there is, therefore there is now no condemnation. So that means, hey, I'm in Christ. I, I, I put my faith in him. I've been obedient to him. I'm following him. So I'm going to mess up right not intentionally, but because it's the world we live in and I screw up sometimes. This doesn't give you a license to sin. It doesn't say, okay, you're going to be forgiven. Just go ahead and do what you want to do. No. Your heart's got to be right. And if you're sincerely trying to follow him, but you still mess up, you still have him standing there in front of you, justified. So uh, we kinda, we've learned this stuff. Last week, this great verse, we looked at this. <clears throat> and today we're going we're gonna to go on down uh, verses 5 to 17. And we're going to look at this, this epic battle between the, the spirit and the flesh. Or the flesh and the spirit. And again, you, you understand this battle because you're living in it. And I'm living in it. Every single day when we leave here, we will be bombarded with images and thoughts and uh, suggestions and, uh, uh, you know, uh, things that we don't even, we're not even aware of or planted in our brain that we should do something and uh, do it bad or do the bad thing. And so we're fighting this battle. And there are a lot of people uh, who, uh, you know, who are losing this battle a lot. And a lot of people are just giving in. But if you're in Christ, you have every reason to keep fighting. And if you're in Christ, you understand that you will keep fighting. And just to illustrate this battle, it was like, <clears throat> it was like a, a little earlier when I came through uh, before the first service and I came around the back and came up through to get me a bottle of water at the cafe and Jay and Don Templeton were in there. And I was like, okay, I need, I need a bottle of water. And I said, what's under the aluminum foil? I said, what, what's under the aluminum foil? And if you know Don Templeton, you know what Don is famous for. Uh, she's famous for her, uh, her cinnamon buns or her cinnamon rolls. And, uh, and so I'm like Joe back there. Uh, Joe said he, he was tempted to jump across the counter and grab the whole tray and run out the door. <laughs> so Dawn offered me one. She offered me a cinnamon roll, but I know me, and I wouldn't be happy with one. I would have to have two or maybe six. It's like me in a bag of Oreo cookies. You know, th that battle of the flesh, and, but really we're talking about appetite there. It's, it's worse than that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's spiritual. So there's this battle, and we know Jesus was aware of this battle because he found his disciples sleeping while he was praying in the garden, and he came back and he found them sleeping, and he said, guys, he said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And I think he kind of, I don't know if he said this to them or if he was just saying it, Maybe, uh, uh, you know, I'll have to think about that later, but he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? It's weak. We want to do the right thing, but we can't because there's this, 
We talked about these neural pathways that beat the, the path in our brain that tell us this is good, this feels good. That's why addicts have a hard time getting out of that rut, out of that path, because it's just their way of life now. It just feels so good, and this path is beating down their brain. And I'm not talking just about drug addiction. I'm talking about all sorts of addictions and addictive behaviors that create these endorphins in your brain that say, this feels good, this feels good, this feels good. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And, uh, and, and so it's hard to fight that battle and climb that wall and get out of that path and get into a healthy path. So <clears throat> flesh is weak. We know this. Well, let's, let's jump into the scripture and talk about how he rescues us from the flesh today. Let's look at verse 5, 5 and 6. Paul wrote, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So Paul's talking about the mind here, and he's talking about being governed. Everybody knows what it means to be governed, because we have a governor, we have a president, we have leaders, and basically they keep us in line. They, they establish rules, they establish laws, and whoever's in charge, that's kind of the way, you know, we go as a country or a state or a, as a people. If the leaders are bad, the people are bad. It's just kind of that's what the Bible says. As the priests are, so go the people. And, uh, and so we talk about the mind here. And I think the first way that he rescues us is by changing our mindset. You know, the mind is, a, is an incredible thing. It has so much power. We, they say, scientists say we don't even tap the, uh, you know, a, a percentage, just a very small percentage of our brain power. You know, the power of the mind is incredible. It can be a, a, a power for good or it can be a powerful evil. Power for evil, can it? I mean, you think about the things uh, that uh, our policemen and, uh, and, and these people who deal with uh, lawbreakers have to deal with today. I mean, what kind of mind would it take to go into a home and find a two-year-old boy who's been frozen? Who puts a two-year-old boy in the freezer to die? Or the countless other things that our law enforcement people have to walk into and say, how, how could this happen? Why would this happen? What kind of a perverted, messed up, twisted, fallen mind does this person have in order to commit the crimes that he just committed? It can be a terrible thing. You know, it's, uh, what's going on in our world today is... is, uh, is terrible that the power of suggestion from TV shows and, and uh, the internet and, uh, you know, friends and all sorts of things. I mean, uh, this little, this young boy that ate a ghost pepper, did you see that on the news? One of the hottest peppers, I, I, I think it probably could kill you. Why would a kid do that? It didn't kill him as far as I know. Because someone said, hey, you should do this. He got into his head. Man, we need a mindset change, don't we? We need to change our minds about what we're doing and who we're living for. We need to run everything through this filter, I believe, in Philippians chapter 4. Now listen, I'm going to read the white print. You, you read the, the yellow print, okay? You just come in on the yellow print. The first service really did good at this. I, I don't know if you can top them, but we're going to try, all right? Whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, if anything is, or think about such things. You guys did great. You did better than the first service. Look, see those words in yellow? That should be the filter through which your thoughts run. You ask yourself, is this, is this true? Is this noble? Is this right? Is this pure? Is this lovely? The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he said, I take every thought captive. Every thought. In other words... When a thought runs through my mind, if it lingers there, and you know, there's going to be thoughts running through your mind all the time. You can't grab all of them. Some of them, you just got to let them go out the back door, you know? Just kind of open the door and say, get on out. But some of them want to take up, uh, you know, root there. They want to they they live there for a while. And you find yourself captivated by this thought and thinking about it, you know, an obsession. Maybe it's, a, it's an evil sexual obsession or it's, it's about hurting someone or whatever it is. Look. You need to have the wherewithal, if you're in Christ, to grab that thought and say, what are you doing in my brain? And kick it out of there. 
Now, don't do that in front of people where they can see you, but figuratively, you need to do that. What are you doing in my brain? And think about this verse. You see, that's what we can do if we're governed by the Holy Spirit. But if you're not in Christ, you know what you will do? You won't do anything. You'll just let those thoughts take root, and they'll start growing, and they'll produce a garden in your brain, a garden of evil stuff. Let's keep reading. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. This is why you wonder, how can people continue to think like that? They don't have the mind of Christ. Look, we cannot expect non-Christians to act like Christians. They can't do it. It doesn't compute with them. They don't have a clue why this is right and why this is wrong to you. So, that's what the Bible says. Nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So not only does he change our mindset, but he changes our desires. Our desires. He changes what we want. See, he didn't come just to be a resident. He came to be president in your life. He, he came to call the shots, to be the governor. Some people take Psalm 37, 4, and they, they think that's a blank check to, you know, I can have the desires of my heart, whatever I want, God's going to give me. But they forget the first part of that verse that says, take delight in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. You know, it's like being married. When you're, when you're married, you, you, hopefully you get to the point to where it's, it's, not, it's not what I want all the time. It's, honey, what do you want? And I know what you want because I've been married to you for this long, so I'm just going to give you what you want. So I'm taking delight in the Lord. I'm taking delight in my wife. She's not the Lord of our home. I didn't mean to put those in the same category. But sometimes she, she is. <laughs> take delight in your... Listen, guys, you take delight in your wife is what you want. What do you want? You know, is this what you, where you want to go? Is this what you want to eat? I promise you it'll work out better for you in the long run. I didn't hear one amen in the first service either on that comment right there. <laughs> Ladies, you take delight in your husband. It'll work out better for both of you in the long run. So this is not a blank check that I can get whatever I want, whatever the desires of my heart. No, when you start taking delight in someone, it's, you're asking yourself, what do you want? I want to know you. I want to understand you, God. And then my desires, you're going to find your desires are going to change. I know you can't understand this sometimes. You can't imagine how this, that is so important to you, this job or this making this money or being this or being that or, or, or having this uh, in, in your life. I, I don't know, some of you can't understand. How can that not be important to me anymore? Delight yourself in the Lord and watch how God changes your desires. Watch how he changes what's important to you and what you want out of life. So he goes on, he says, you, however, Christians in Rome, you're not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, that's what he says. Like if you're really in Christ, you don't live in the realm of the flesh anymore. You don't have to deal with that stuff as much. You're going to fight it, but you're, you're no condemnation. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. You see, it's not only a mindset and a desire change, but He changes my perspective. See, this is not just walking around and grabbing thoughts. This is, this is my starting point. This is where I'm coming from. It's my old perspective. Several years ago, a guy by the name of Tommy Oakes was here. He preached when we were in our old building over there. Remember Tommy Oakes, anybody? He was a master storyteller. He's a great preacher. He, he he's travels around here. We haven't had him for a while, but he pointed to the center beam in, the, in that building over there that we now call the big house, Kids Own Big House. There's a center beam that runs along the, the uh, top of the ceiling. And he said, I want you to think about that beam being eternity. That's eternity. And he made us say it, eternity, and it's a long. He says, and then your life on that beam, well, it's just a speck up there. He said he called it a dot, so it's just a dot. It's just a dot. Your life is a dot. Well, that made us feel bad at first, and then he thought, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, my life is just a dot, that's it, I'm just a, I'm done? Yeah, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? If by strength we might live to be 80, 
but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's three score and ten, which is, which is 70. So he said, your life is a dot, and everything in your life is a dot. That stuff you stay up at night thinking about, losing sleep over, the, uh, the worries you have, the anxieties you have, that stuff you're trying to protect and wash and, and, and you know, and look good, and, and all that stuff is just a dot. And that very week, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure it was that week or close to that week, and my wife's here to verify or, uh, or not this story. I hope she does, though. Uh, she, it wasn't long after that, she clipped a mailbox with the mirror of our van. And it wasn't the first mirror she had clipped, but she reminded me. She said, hey, uh, it's just a dot. I'm like, yeah, go on. I can't. how can you argue with that? The preacher just said that. It's just a dot. You don't have to get all bent out of shape about a broken mirror like us guys do sometimes. It's just a dot. Well, see, you know what that is? That is an eternal perspective. We think eternity. It's all about perspective. It's, it's, it's deciding that, hey, while my dot is here, I'm going to make the most of every single opportunity because I don't have, a, I don't have death in me now. My life now means something. It can matter on the, on the scope of eternity. It's like those, the old uh, man's support group that, that met every week. Actually, they met two or three times a week in Florida. Did you hear about them? They were old guys. One was 98, and one of the guys was 96. One was 95, and one was 92. And they used to meet every week and. Uh, uh, you know, in the cafeteria, and they would talk about their problems to support each other. And, and uh, they started talking one day, and one old guy said, he said, yeah, he said, he said, fellas, my, my arm is so weak. He said, I can't, even, I can't even lift a cup of coffee to my mouth. The second guy said, oh, he said, man, I know what you're talking about. He said, my cataracts are so bad. He said, I can't even see my cup of coffee. The third guy said, Fellas, he said, I, I, I know what you mean. He said, the arthritis in my neck, he said, it's so bad. I can't even turn to tell the waitress I need a cup of coffee. The fourth guy, he said, uh, he said fellas, he said, I, I know exactly what you mean. My memory, he said, my memory's so bad. He said, uh, I can't even remember what I ordered to drink. A few seconds passed. And one of them said, yeah, he said, but... Thank God we can all still drive. <laughs> Have you been to Florida lately? I, t I told my daughter, I said, uh, Taylor, who just moved to Florida, I said, uh, you know as a nurse down there what you're going to be doing about 90% of the time. Um, so just get ready. I'm kind of glad she's doing that because I'll be old one day. And at least one of my girls, uh, you know, i got one that works with babies and one that will work with older folks. And... and uh, I guess it's about the same, isn't it, when you're taking care of them as a nurse? But it's about, it's about perspective. It's like, you know, hey, listen, a lot of stuff's happening, but thank God, I am a dot. It changes. Let's keep going. Ecclesiastes says, moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. That might be the end of your dot today. I hope not. Or mine. So let's make the most of every opportunity. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now in this, this verse right here, he uses this word obligation. See that word obligation. That word means uh, to pay a debt. To pay a debt. We're obligated. We, we pay a de debt. We're going to talk about how he changes our purpose. This past week, I was uh, scrolling through my Facebook feed, and I saw some church members on my Facebook feed, which I see all the time. But this particular uh, was a video clip of Brett and Laura Ashley. How many of you know Brett and Laura? You know Brett and Laura Ashley? You know what they did this past week? They drove to Nashville to be on the Dave Ramsey uh, radio show so that they could do their debt scream. And it seems over the last 14 months, they have paid off I think something like $45,000. And their salaries weren't astronomical. But they were able to pay it off because they, they sacrificed and they 
They had a purpose. They had purpose for this is what we're doing. Because they didn't like being obligated to a debtor. Who does? Because you're a slave to that person. So they, they, they screamed, we are debt free. I love that line that Jordan sang a while ago, that the praise team sang uh, in that song, How Can It Be, that says, you gave your life, what's the next part? To give me mine. You see, if we're going to be in debt, if we're going to be obligated, let's not be obligated to something that's dead, that's dying. Let's be obligated to God who gives us life. Let's be obligated to him and him alone. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. We'll finish it out here with this last uh, three, four verses. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is an incredible verse right here. By the way, Abba was, uh, I believe, an Aramaic word that means daddy. It means daddy. We, we can call God daddy, our close, intimate father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The last thing that he changes to rescue us from our flesh is he changes our identity. Well, what a great example today. Today we have little Flo Kinsey who, who's got a whole new identity. No longer does she have to uh, scrounge around in Haiti on the ground to try to find something to eat or be fed with the leftovers but she has a new identity. She's got a new last name, just like Nicholas does, just like little Tide does, just like so many, uh, like Grace and Alex. They have a new identity. They don't have to walk around wondering, where's my home? Where's my forever home? Where, where my, who are my parents? They can hold their head high and say, I, this is who I am. You know, not only are we in the uh, and the, hopefully the, some of the final stages of adoption, but many of you have met our little foster daughter who came to us from Wellsburg in a uh, roundabout way. We weren't looking into foster care. We weren't even interested in it. But God kind of put it in our laps. And, and uh, so little Katie Long, uh, who has had a history of neglect and abuse, came to our home. Her mother died. Her grandparents died. And she's been with us now about a year and a half. And... Uh, some of the foster homes that she was in weren't really like homes. They were maybe just places to live, like a dormitory or a ward. And uh, so she came to our house, and um, it's been a struggle. It's been a tough struggle because uh, she has a lot of baggage and a lot of different genetics and, and uh, a lot of stuff, you know. On top of that, she's 13. And uh, that's enough right there, isn't it? So, recently, in the last few months, we had to ask her, do you want this to be your home? If you do, you have to write it down. And so she wrote it down. I want them to be my parents. I want this to be my home. She made that choice. And, you know, I, I think you today are given the same opportunity. Unlike what some people believe, I don't think God is going to force anybody into the family. I don't think he's going to force anybody to become a child of his. I think he says, it's here. I want you in my family. I'm giving you all these benefits. And I invite you to come. So I'm going to ask you to stand up with me as the praise team comes. And I'm going to invite you into his family. I can do that because I'm a co-heir with Christ. And I want to invite you to come and be a part of his family today. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing this, this final song that really expresses this battle between the flesh and the spirit and how the spirit will always win if you let him.
Lord God, thank you today for adopting us into your family, for allowing us to call you Father, for promising us a reward and heaven, for hiding us in your Son when we can't stand by ourselves, not in this struggle, not in this battle, but in Christ we can. Thank you for that. Lord, as we invite those who would come today to come and meet you maybe for the first time or to resolve again to follow you, that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You come as we sing.